and you're going to see that that's really what's changed as well. So here's another slide that kind of shows what was happening down here in 2015. These are the national ransomware families. So you see we have like three to five at any point, kind of a dip in June, I don't know why, but uh, I'm sure our data analysts have all kinds of explanations for that. Um, really that was kind of fairly flat, and now you're seeing 2016 is the year of ransomware, right? This is like now the most common threat we're seeing day in, day out. And you can see the family wares have now gone up, I believe it's like 29 now, but you see a, a number of families out there. So um, this is really about the monetization piece. We talked about why are we doing this, so we kind of saw how we got here. This is why, looking at Spambox again, we talked briefly about. It may not be fair to say a script kitty, but really what we're saying is the level of sophistication needed to do these exploits was very low, right? Basically, I'm going to create a botnet. I'm going to have to wait a long time to create that botnet, get it to send out spam emails. Again, you have less than 1% hit rate people are finding the spam. So it takes a long time from the time that I actually infect the computer to the time that I can actually go ahead and start making money, right? But it had a low level of sophistication, low amount of money, took a long time. Moving kind of to a middle ground here, let's look at the banking Trojans, right? Now I'm sitting on, I have to infect you, I have to sit there and wait till you go to your bank site. There could be several <laughs> updates, it could be many days, maybe even many weeks before you actually go to the bank site. And so I have to maintain a persistent infection. I have to avoid detection that whole time. Uh, and essentially, that's the problem with these, both of these. They have to have a botnet or a banking source to maintain a persistent infection, right? So why the move to crypto ransomware? We got this uh, scary looking dude over here. This really represents organized crime, right? So that's what we're talking about. This is a line of business for organized crime. It's a lot safer. Well, international law is not as strict. You know, when I uh, go and you think of uh, like Goodfellas or movies like that where they go in and they extort protection money. If you don't, I'm going to break your arm or you know, I don't like something to do, I'm going to kill you. Well, no country really likes people. Most countries don't. That go around murdering people. So if you think about it, I don't want to take that person. International law pretty well covers extradition and things on uh, murders or going around breaking people's arms. So really what we move to is this is a safe way to do it. I can get that uh, essentially the same thing, that extortion money. Has very low, low risk. Now I have the dark web, I have Bitcoin, so I'm anonymized, I can hide out. Right now, uh, really the law and the governments have not caught up to how to catch these people using those dark web and uh, the Bitcoins and uh, you know, those types of systems. So really what you see here is that it's moved to this crypto ransomware, we get more money, the players are really much more organized uh, people. And the reason again is that monetization. I can make a lot of money, I can get the infection, you can come down, download the infection. Within minutes, you can encrypt files. So I know a lot of us were thinking about from the good guy's perspective, you think about encryption. You think about, well, it takes all day to encrypt a hard drive, right? They're not doing that. They're saying, I'm going to encrypt your Word documents, your database files, I'm going to encrypt uh, your pictures, and the things you care about. So I can encrypt those files. I've seen some testing that shows 70 megabytes of Word files, for example, sorry, 700 megabytes of Word files can be encrypted in like 30 seconds. So really, I deliver this, I infect you, I get the ransomware and encrypt your stuff, and then the time I'm asking you for money can be 20 minutes later, I'm saying give me money, your files are locked. And then I'm going to give you, what, a day, two days, six days to do it. So really I can make a quick buck on this, and that's kind of why this direction has occurred. Here's a little uh, article we found that kind of shows that. And this is uh, from CNN Money, and if you look at it, it shows that the cost is reasonable, not high, but importantly down here, they collected $209 million so far. And this is the first three months of 2016. And according to this, at least we'll see if that comes true in December, uh, but it says it's on track to be a billion dollar industry for these people. So again, that's why all the efforts going here is a great way for these threat actors to make money. Going a little bit uh, further in that, this kind of shows you starting in January and we ended in June. Here's a lot of the uh, ransomware families in here. And just briefly highlighting, you know, if you get Emperor in January 2013, that was 13 Bitcoin. So that's quite a lot of money today. Uh, I know Bitcoin's changed all the time. Uh, this one was about 30 bucks, Crip Shed. Uh, moving into Locky, Locky's been around a long time and it continually evolves. So that's like half of Bitcoin, but I forgot what half of Bitcoin to one Bitcoin is. But, you know, again, it's a decent amount of money. Uh, here's one Petcho that we like. Oh, by the way, I should mention, 
Monty comes in through MacroSpan. So just quickly, we'll get into uh, details later where we show some of the uh, methods you can use to prevent ransomware. But if you have something that comes in and says, all right, I can block these executables, and I do machine learning and all this, MacroSpan typically gets right through there. So you have to make sure your solution doesn't just stop executables or isn't just a blacklist, but uh, that you're also looking at macros. A lot of people moved away from that because they thought, well, that's old school. Well, coming back, as you see. So here is RDP Bruce Force Bucky, uh, five bitcoins. And uh, you have an exploit kit here as well. Uh, I did want to mention that get up briefly. Sorry for being distracted and going out of order. Uh, you know, one to two bitcoins here, this overwrites the MDR if you don't pay in time. So we're getting that destruction now where you better pay us, and if you don't pay us, we're going to end up deleting your final time, just keeping it encrypted forever. So uh, briefly going into the recent crypto activity, to show a little bit of it, this is Lockheed, which is very prevalent here, uh, arise often, not only, but in this case through malicious macro, and you can kind of see, here's what you're going to get. We'll have a little bit talk about business email compromise and uh, this kind of social engineering common method, right? So if somebody comes in here and they open the attachment, that attachment has a macro, right? So, and then it goes ahead and installs it. So it's gonna go, and this is actually not the ransomware file, this is the downloader. It's gonna infect you with a Trojan. That Trojan point is to go out and get the ransomware, and bring it down, then the ransomware will work to encrypt your files. And that's what you're seeing at the installation here. And you can kind of see it's gonna delete itself after encryption, right? So we don't need to maintain persistent infection. Your files are already encrypted. Uh, you know, so it's creates the auto start registry, renames encrypted files to DocLocky, and it modifies the internet uh, explorer zone, maybe so you can go to their site and pay them if you need to do so. So lastly, we're getting the payload piece, and now this is where I'm delivering the payload, saying, yeah, you gotta pay me $209, right? Half a big one, so. Briefly, uh, looking at catch your ransomware. This is the one that basically says your computer's been encrypted. One of the things you see a lot here with ransomware is that things basically are designed to scare you, right? So we got this psyche component. You're often going to see these Jolly Roger looking things and skulls and crossbones and hey, this is a really scary thing. And then here's a shot clock right here. This is what you have left to pay. And uh, if you don't, you get the red screen of death, as we call it. And now we're going to try to, or probably will, overwrite your NPR. So, Server is up here because it's the one that talks to me. You guys probably remember some of the early ransomwares that went out and said, warning, we've been encrypted. And basically, it reads this to you, gives you instructions. Uh, the variant we found currently, only the English when we actually look at it works, but you can see they're really planning to expand uh, their uh, countries that they're affecting as well. And uh, here is server, and uh, that's the, uh, you know, yep, that's it. And so you can see it's uh, server side as well. And look at this here, warping every 15 seconds. So if you have a vendor that says, oh, we only update once a day or something like that, and you're only relying on blacklist, you've got to really go beyond the blacklist and traditional AV technologies. And also ensure that if you are using those, that they're updating frequently, that they're updating every 10 minutes, every two minutes, whatever it may be as things happen. And this kind of talks a little bit briefly about the hash factory. So what they're doing is they're changing a little piece that changes the hash. So as you know, if you blacklist something and says this is a bad hash, let's go ahead and block it. Well, if I change one thing in that file, right? One attribute, all of a sudden you have a different hash. So that's one of the methods they're using to evade this. MacTub uh, is interesting. So MacTub is really showing that professionalization here, right? So I mean, this is something that, uh, if you remember some of those other things, yeah, I could have done some of those other stalls on myself, right? This is something that, very much graphic artist driven. Uh, you know, it kind of says, hello, you've been encrypted, and we're sorry about it. Uh, very, you know, professional layout here. Uh, <laughs> here's, here's the proof that we're not lying. I'll let you keep on encrypt a file, and you can see that this actually works. And uh, how much does it cost? It kind of increases throughout the day. Again, we see the shot clock up here, and you know how much time. So during the first three days, it's 1.4 bitcoins. Six or more, you're 3.9 Bitcoin. So it can go up incrementally, right? So it kind of designs to say, okay, I'm scared to see all this death looking stuff. I got the shot clock here. I'm ready to go ahead and uh, to pay this. And now, as a lot of people aren't familiar with Bitcoin, how do I pay? Okay, here you go. Here's how you purchase Bitcoin. <laughs> so, wow. 
definitely uh, a lot better. You saw at the beginning, we saw a lot of them use kind of a text file, uh, again, ASCII art that I think I used to make when I was a kid on my Commodore's kind of thing. Now we're really getting that professionalization there. SAMSAM is interesting uh, because this is done through an exploit, right? And that exploit affects Linux servers running JBox. So if you all remember the good old days when we said, I got Linux, I don't need anti-malware, and uh, you know, it's not affected. Well, you know, Linux has proliferated a lot. And you'd be dumb when there's data in here if you want that. You have to start exploiting it. If that's what you're seeing, it comes in and finds that exploit, and then it's going to go ahead and, uh, you know, same thing, deliver uh, encrypt your files there as well. Now Jigsaw, clearly it's uh, the guy from Saw in here. So again, you see a commonality that's designed to scare you, here's your time. But the interesting thing about this is it kind of says, I'm gonna play a game with you here. And what that game is, is uh, I'm gonna increase this exponentially. So the first few hours, maybe I delete a few files. The next few hours, uh, the next day, I'm gonna delete a few hundred files. If you still don't pay me, I'm gonna delete thousands. And I'm gonna delete all your files if you don't pay me uh, within a certain amount of time. So that's essentially scaring you and reminding you. Uh, if you try, you can uh, view one encrypted file again, so they're giving you that ability to say, prove to me it works. Uh, and lastly, uh, of course, a way to pay, but then lastly, the thing to remember is if you delete it as a punishment, you're going to be a thousand files deleted. And this is if you were about to restart, you're about to make a very bad decision. Are you sure? And if you hit OK and reboot, it's good. Next time it comes up, it deletes a thousand files to uh, punish you, so to speak. And as you know, one of the things you might try to do is reboot to try to get into the safe mode or whatever. So this is another way they're trying to, uh, not that that would work necessarily, but it's a way they're trying to uh, get you to act on it. And uh, Chimera is also interesting because this is the first one that's it's really an extortion request. So this is more typical of ransomware. You remember MacTub looked very professionally graphic artist. This is kind of typical, like some guy typed it, you can tell right here. but. The thing about this is not only is it going to charge you the money, but if you don't do it, we're going to post everything up on the internet. We're going to share all your stuff. So now you've taken that extortion to the next level here. So that kind of moves us into arrival and compromise. And uh, just briefly, we'll talk about the infection chain here. So we have the arrival. We have two ways we typically see this come in. So you see this through spam email or through a malicious URL. So either, either one, they kind of come in the same place. I mean, you can get the malicious <coughs> URL through the email, or maybe the email included another mechanism like the exploit kit in the macro we saw. Uh, once you get it, you see a couple different downloaders here. And what they're both doing, these infections, aren't designed to do the, anything other than get the cripple, get the ransomware, right? So that's what we're really doing here. To move to execution, we download cripple in this case, now you're infected with crypt wall. Crypt wall means a little bit of time, a few minutes to go ahead and uh, encrypt your files. So we create an auto start and we inject ourselves into the operating system. That way if it got rebooted or something happened in between, we can make sure we restart. And then when it starts back up, it's going to go ahead and do its thing. And what its thing is, is how the infection works. It talks to a communication server. It's going to get the cryptographic keys. It's going to encrypt your user files. To make it hard for you, it's going to delete the shadow copies, because that would be a great way to just check by shadow copies and go back. Well, <coughs> we can delete those. It's going to uninstall itself. So remember, we don't have to maintain that persistent infection. That's a really uh, new thing about ransomware. And then it's going to display the ransomware. <coughs> so now you can't just go and say, I'm going to uninstall this and get my computer back like you could with the old ransomware. You're actually now kind of forced to pay. That's what they're trying to move you to. And looking at the uh, infection vector briefly again, so use of compromised sites is pretty common. So a lot of websites have poor security out there. They're looking for common, let's think about SQL injection. I go out, I do some recon, find this bad stuff here, and oh, this site's vulnerable, go ahead and compromise it. So you're going to some place you think is legitimate, it doesn't have to be bad. It can be a blog, it can be uh, you know something about working out or a smaller site that doesn't really have the security resources to secure the site. And that's how it's getting compromised, and so it could often take over a legit site. And uh, essentially provide command and control. One thing I do want to highlight is capture sites as well as adware. If I can display an ad on your computer, I can also do a lot of other things. So that's sort of what how they're also using a lot of the adware to get in here as well. And this briefly just shows some uh, outbreaks that happened. But 
why I really have this up here is to show you some examples of what we're really seeing with the business email and the email compromise. So a lot of this trend is going towards the social engineering. So, uh, you know, we've all seen this one that says your partial couldn't be delivered. Well, if this got to a guy in logistics and business, that's how they're doing that kind of targeting now, that person might go ahead and click on it. And, uh, you know, here's the requested document trend it still works. And uh, the interview bill, of course, is important too, especially if, uh, you know, we got an uh, important message for you. So that's sort of how this is another method they're starting to use as far as uh, business email compromises. Here's a little bit of uh, the kind of things we talked about on that. So, you know, avisbrokers.com, I don't see anything wrong with that. That's some place anybody can go to, any one of our users, and uh, sorry, and that did get compromised. And you can see a lot of these aren't necessarily the kind of bad sites you would think. They're not necessarily great. And you can see this, when you see this kind of stuff going on, you know that's never really good anyway. So, uh, again, just, this is a small sample. This is only on the 12th of July that we're seeing this sample here. So this is just a sample of the kind of things we're seeing here. That's the key to making sure uh, your vendor can do web reputation filtering as well beyond the traditional anti-malware and go out and scan for these kind of things and be able to update your software to protect you from those kind of things. So this briefly hits exploit kits and the associated uh, vulnerabilities they take advantage. So remember ransomware needs that exploit kit before it can download the ransomware itself. So the first thing you do is you exploit with rig or angler is very common. Uh, what I do want to point out here is 15 years ago, we all thought about Microsoft. Microsoft has gotten really good at providing patches on Patch Tuesday and having ways for us to deliver them, things like SCCM. So really a lot of what's not happening today is so many people I mean say, what are you doing for third-party software? Oh, well, I don't patch that, I just patch Microsoft. And if you look, a lot of this is coming through FlashNet. And that's because people don't patch it as well. And also, let's face it, Adobe is not as good at providing updates to their software. So essentially, that shows that key strategy we're going to get into later is going to be patching, right? And this kind of shows that same deal here. Here's the exploit kit. Here's the ransomware it delivers in 2015. You can see it's expanding, right? And you can see Crylock here. Here's CryptWall in several places. So you can't just say, if I'm locking Neutrino, you can still get some of these down here. You can get Locky here from Nuclear. You can also get it from Neutrino, for example. So again, um, the exploit kit's delivering it, and these are the kinds of ransomware we're delivering through this. So stopping those vulnerabilities, stopping that exploit is uh, a key strategy there as well. So moving into protections and best uh, practices and solutions. So protecting against ransomware. The neat thing about protecting against ransomware, I should say, is that these are things you should be doing not just for ransomware, but for any kind of protection, right? Even if it's not ransomware specific. So backing up and restoring, that's something we need to be doing better. And I know that we've all heard of this for as long as we've been working in IT, but uh, really that's something that is the key. Because if it all else fails, you've got to have some way to get back, right? So three copies, two formats, and one air cap, right? If you have all of them connected to the network, a lot of the ransomware families now are looking for shares, data backup, even things in the cloud, and they are going ahead and encrypting those as well. So you've got to have one that's uh, air gap. I think the two formats, if you guys have been around long enough, we all came up with that tape years ago that we had to uh, restore and get it work. So again, make sure you have a couple types of media there. Keep current and patching, that's really important. And the reason is you saw that these exploits and the vulnerabilities are exploiting. So if you didn't have that vulnerability, you're significantly reducing it. And uh, you know, there's vendors like Trig Micro that do have what we have is something called virtual patching, soft patching. We can scan these systems. We can go ahead and say, here's everything that system is vulnerable to, and now we're going to block all those exploits, even if the vendor doesn't have a patch. And that's a great mitigating control in the meanwhile as well to help block that while you can get the patch applied. So and I guess, again, what I'm driving home is you can't just have one solution, and you don't want just your traditional anti malware You need to go with more sophisticated vendors. Uh, this is critical. I know we all struggle with this. So your employee education on phishing, make sure that your security awareness is going to talk about ransomware, phishing, uh, business email compromise. So at least you can say the employees are aware. Uh, you know, people uh, can as well have the test at the end to prove they paid attention. And then periodically you can go and uh, test that, right? You can go in and have hire a company that's going to call 10 people or send 
and emails and see who responds. And of course, remedial training is important. And that's kind of the stick. The carrot is say, hey, whoever gets the highest score, if you score all 10 out of 10 or something, they give you an iPad. So there's the carrot to help as well. So just a suggestion. <laughs> Access control is a critical piece. Um, you know, years ago, I was working uh, at a company, and uh, we had a software management, uh, inventory management piece, right? And what, the, what it did is it let me go on and say, hey, who is uh, an administrator of local admin, right? So every day I would respond to incidents. That was my primary lead, my job on uh, looking at network monitoring, on IPS, et cetera. And then the first thing I would do is say, who's been infected? I'd take that list of people. Guess what, 97% or something, once we put all the data together every month, we're local admins. So limiting that privilege, Remember, a lot of software, not always, because you can't get around and do privilege escalations, but typically things can only execute at the level of the currently logged on user. So again, not making everybody a local admin, which I'm sure your users where you're limiting that is helpful. This also goes beyond, as you know, ransomware spreads to shares, right? It's going to infect one system, and it's going to look for a share to infect. So one of the things you want to do is ensure you have good access control on your shared data as well. So if somebody from HR has access to everything, when that person gets infected, it goes out and looks for SMB shares, and now you're infecting uh, things like your accounting data, maybe the CEO's data, et cetera. If you said the HR guy on the better alternative only had access to the HR data, guess what? You're only infecting HR in worst case. So this generates a little bit of uh, confusion sometimes. So there was a rumor that the FBI was six months ago said go ahead and pay it and to be fair we have seen uh, the company uh, Hollywood Presbyterian did pay and they did get it back I can assure you from what we're seeing that's the exception so if you pay two things are going to happen one you're probably not going to get it ever see your data again so a lot of times they don't keep the promise right I mean the kind of people we're dealing with here so not like you and I make a contract and we say oh yeah I honor my contract they don't and the other thing is if you ever remember the days of telemarketing scams Somebody would do a telemarketing scan, and they would say, hey, this guy responded. And that guy would get sold later to another third party. And what he maintained is what's called a, a it's, you know, no offense to anybody who's ever done this, but it's called a sucker list. And the sucker list was bought by these other scam artists. So it's kind of the same thing. If you pay, they say, this guy pays, and you get added to that list, and then that's sold to other bad guys. So it's so another line of business. So again, recommending not to pay for the for that reason as well as you may not get it back anyway. It's really better to have these other things in place to start. And of course, last is improving the security posture, right? So you don't want to just say, well, I got an antivirus and I'm good. You want a vendor that also offers things like uh, web reputation, able to uh, have a huge network where I say, I have a solution on every stage so I can provide, and we'll see this later, things like web reputation, things like endpoint protection, application control, et cetera. So you want to move beyond just one piece. There is no silver bullet is the point here. So you've got to have a lot of things in effect. This I start with, but this is your know, last resort. This is what you don't want to do. But at least be able to do that if you don't have an ability to, to do it. Well, if all else fails, at least you should be able to have that and restore it. So uh, this is uh, Trend Micro's approach here. I have different buckets and different areas to talk about the protection. So, you know, again, this is your data center. You need to be able to protect data centers, obviously, uh, regardless of the physical servers, virtual servers, AWS, and you're be able to protect, however, hybrid cloud, right? So public, private, so be able to protect that. Network defenses are important, right? You have to see what's happening on your network. Uh, and that includes things like communication with command control, what kind of lateral movement do I have on my network, as well as Sandboxing, right? So that's going to protect your network pretty well. And then having user protection, right? So on that endpoint, what kind of software am I running? Running anti malware running specific behavioral analysis that detects machine learning that can detect uh, some of the ransomware things. And that ties into everybody's got an ore in the water, but how big is your ore? So, you know, looking at a company that has a lot of threat research going on, you know, we personally have 1,800 threat researchers and data scientists that look at this stuff every day. You're collecting hundreds of millions of endpoints, crawling hundreds of millions of websites. So that builds what's going to feed this in here, right? So if you have a small company that's saying, well, you know, we update and just kind of look at things, we have 50 guys look at this, it's not going to be as good as collecting the data. It's really a data mining opportunity to think about it and analytics here. And last, tying 
all together. This is, makes it a lot easier if you can correlate the data and see it in that single pane of glass to use the bus with, right? See so all from one place. And this is a bit what I talked about, right? So again, you want to make sure that your vendor is using some of these pieces here as well so you have a good network that's really coming in and then a lot of people uh, working just to do threat research. Uh, having the smart patterns, right? Patterns that update frequently, that's important. We want to update once a day. But going beyond blacklist, look for vendors that have machine learning, uh, advanced detection analytics, behavior analysis that's specific to ransomware. Uh, what happens if things start encrypting? One of the things uh, we can do, for example, is if it does get through the net by some chance and starts encrypting, we say, well, this is not authorized encryption, we're going to shut you down. Maybe you only lose two or three hours to share with the whole computer. So there's a lot of uh, things in here. And of course, that all comes back to data, right? So it's all the data mining and the data analysis correlating the threat lifecycle through the lateral movement, through seeing what's happening with all those other endpoints that you collect anonymized data from and see what's happening out there for hundreds of millions of different sites and different uh, endpoints. So briefly talking about targets, servers, right? I mean, they're fairly well protected. One of the advantages of servers is we don't have the same risky behavior that we have on endpoints, right? Most server admins, I hope not, are not going out and surfing the web and checking their email on the server, right? So you kind of eliminated the entry point, but as you saw with SamSam, for example, there are things that are targeting servers, and where they become a target is lateral movement. Remember that lowly endpoint? User gets infected, it searches an SMB share, and then it can get your data that way. So moving on to the network, right? We want to protect the network layer as well. So that's a possible point of entry. Now we're spreading through there. So having something that can detect and uh, respond to things out there, at least make you aware of it, as well as do some sandboxing, is useful there. And lastly, this is where we see a lot of the action, but of course the ultimate goal is to get that server drunk, right? And get everything uh, encrypted on that for these bad people. So endpoints are the most common target. They're also unprotected. I mean, how good is our vulnerability management program on an endpoint. It's not going to be as robust as the servers typically. We prioritize servers because we think that's where the data is. However, this is the entry point. And web and spear phishing, as you saw, are very common there as well. So this kind of shows the uh, entry points over on the right. We've got our ransomware here. That's going to come into our organization here, right? So this is really where we want to focus and where we really want to stop stuff. A lot of this is coming in through email, the vast majority of it. So you got to have an email gateway and make sure your email gateway isn't just doing spam like traditionally, right? That was great 10 years ago. We stopped spam and that's what we bought these email gateways for. Today, you want to do anti-malware in there. You want to do sandboxing in there as well so you can explode on known threats inside a sandbox. So uh, you want to also say what's web reputation. Web reputation really has been around for a number of years. You know, we hear a lot about machine learning and all that. This is really the original machine learning. This is coming out, it's crawling websites every day and saying, what are the bad websites? And what we're talking about here when I say reputation isn't going to be web content filtering. Oh, this is a hate site or a porn site, or I don't want people going here because it uses too much bandwidth. We're not talking about that. We're talking about compromised command control servers, sites that contain malicious code, and updating that on a pretty much constant as well as an IP web reputation. So again, uh, collecting uh, you know, a lot of data, trend happens to collect 100 terabytes of data a day. And that's what's feeding IP and web reputation, because that can get stale quickly, so you've got to constantly collect it. Uh, you know, in spear phishing, I'll mention there are protections that we have that basically go in and we'll say, who did this come from? What are we seeing if we're collecting from all those endpoints? What's the source? What's the reputation of that person? Is the from and the sender different? So all the things that use some advanced analytics, again, I'm not a data scientist, but it works pretty well. And it comes in and says, okay, this is a spam email. It's so, uh, like social engineering email, because that's, again, where a lot of that comes from. So again, the ability to go beyond just your, web, your email gateway stopping spam, that's an annoyance. You need to actually stop that from threat. Moving on to another sector is your web gateway, right? So now we're talking about users over here going out, right? Say somehow they're able to get through this where you don't have this protection in place. Now they're going out. Well, if you have IP and web reputation, again, updated constantly, that's going to help you as well, right? Because that's going to end up being uh, another area as it's leaving that can catch it. 
So moving to the end point now, right? Ideally, we'd be catching these things over here, but sometimes things get through. So on the end point is where you want specific things for ransomware behavior monitoring, right? So application control, uh, as well as vulnerability shielding, and web security. Web security on your end point will provide the same protection, the web reputation here, but in addition, we might have browser exploit protection. You want vulnerability shielding on the endpoint, so if you don't patch your endpoints often, well, you can create rules that block those vulnerabilities from actually occurring, the exploit from occurring against that vulnerability. And of course, application control is important too. If I limit what can execute on that, that's really going to be effective as well. And moving to the network side, right? So we want to scan network traffic. We want to look at malware sandboxes. A key differentiator to look for in vendors is to say, can I do custom sandboxes? A lot of these malware people, really good at writing ransomware that can detect am I in a sandbox. And when it's in a sandbox, it stops executing. And when it stops executing, at that point, you don't see what really happened on that endpoint. You just see in the sandbox that it didn't execute. So having a custom sandbox where you can upload your own folded images and execute in there will show you how it actually executes. So that's one thing to look for as a differentiator of your vendors. And of course, lateral movement. A lot of people can see ingress and egress, what's coming in and out. Do I see command and control? That's easy to do. But you might also want to know what's going on from server to server or from server to workstation there. And you can see that there in the server and how these endpoint and the server are connected by that lateral movement, right? So I want to be able to detect with my network scanning what's happening from here to there as well. So again, uh, you know, we do offer that kind of thing, so I'm sure your vendor does have those additional protections. As well, we talked about vulnerability shielding already. But I do want to point out server protection is more than anti-malware. We also want that web reputation in there. We also want things like integrity monitoring and uh, log inspection in those areas as well. So ensure you have those detective controls in place as well. And uh, this kind of shows a brief, uh, it's taken over a two week period, and it shows where this data we collected, where things were blocked. So if you see on email blocking, at that gateway, we blocked 92% of threats, 93 almost. And that's really where you want to get 20 million total in these two weeks. So most ransomware should be stopped at the gateway level. Why wait to get to the endpoint and provide that? Or stop it when it's coming in. So again, that's the critical thing about ensuring your vendor is not just a spam gateway, that you're able to do a lot of the advanced uh, anti-ransomware features right in your gateway. Oops. So URL blocking is also going to be the next 6, 7%. That was about 1.4 hit, million hits. And you can see that to users, like if they go to the website itself, got to be able to block that coming from the inside out, right? So there's another uh, option as well. Now if you look at file detection, this is your traditional file detection. We know that's a bad hash. That's less than half a percent should be getting caught there. And that, if it's updated on a regular basis, is going to be barely effective. And the advantage of having a traditional black <coughs> detection is that I'm not consuming your computing resources by running on here. Right, because it's really easy to check a hash file. If you say, I got it, if I don't have these things, and I don't have this, or I'm only doing this, this is resource intensive down here. So you really want to get rid of the obvious stuff first, and you see now we're dealing with less than 1% should be found by machine learning, behavior analysis, et cetera. And that's where we say behavior monitoring for known threats. We know that files that take these five steps are uh, going to uh, you know, essentially be a very small percentage here. And then on no threats, right? That's where we're really into machine learning. So you really should be looking at having a very small save that that's happening here at the endpoint. This is your last resort, is I guess what I'm really getting at. Your first resort should be able to. And just uh, briefly, I'll take any questions after. So just uh, put my uh, trend micro plug in and see we've been around a long time, been providing this for 27 years, uh, $1 billion company, 500,000 uh, business customers. Uh, you know, 96% of the top global companies, 100% of the top 10 automotive, 100% uh, of the telecom companies, 80% of the top banks, and 90% of the top 10 oil companies. So we're pretty well have some good clients, uh, been doing this a long time, so hopefully again you'll consider us and we'll create your future needs. So thank you. Any questions? I'm curious what, uh, what your thoughts are on doing like uh, application like this team. I don't remember like with the PI enterprise versus uh, SRP. I, 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 I think that's one of the most effective ways uh, is to do application whitelisting, right? Because if I can control what executable is on there, I can really stop things from writing. If I say only these 
mattress can run. Are there ways around it? Yeah, we've seen a, a vendor that uh, did not take care of their hash, day, hash files, and those were compromised, but uh, ideally a larger vendor that wouldn't happen. So uh, it is a good method. Uh, one thing Trend offers is we have uh, 40,000. We have the largest certified safe software service. So you don't need, a lot of times with application whitelisting, you're thinking about, I gotta hire a full-time employee to sit and babysit this thing. If you go in and you say, my vendor provides that for me, that gives you a significant advantage too. So I think not only should you be doing it, but looking at something that can go in an assessment mode and then lock down after you know what's running, as well as providing you many of the good hashes ahead of time. And in conjunction with blacklisting, that's a very good approach, actually. Yes, please. What about the endpoint hard drives? How about the hardware encrypting hard drives before the binary is in the kind of security that you don't give? Sorry, I, I don't understand. You said uh, hard, hard drives, you know, encrypting the hard drives would be a hardware yep. uh, before you ever do anything with the machine. I mean, how much would that keep out as far as, you know, the master boot record and that kind of thing? If the client never has admin rights to it, the hard drives are already encrypted. Yep. Yeah, I think the key you hit on there is the admin rights. So not having admin rights is very important. Encrypting the hard drive itself, you think about the user is already logged into Windows, it can execute at that level and still encrypt the individual files. Remember, it, it might not enter. So even if I didn't get the master boot record, like in the case of Petya, yeah. right, I could still encrypt all those files, and chances are the way cryptography works, you might get it back one day as computing resources incurred, but like 30 years from now, right? right. So <laughs> anything else? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate all your time.